there should be reason and rationality in religion as well as in society more generally. I'm Max Nosvich, the manager of visitor experiences here at the First Amendment Museum located in Augusta, Maine. Uh, today, I'm joined by our very special guest, Malcolm Gaskill. Malcolm, thank you for joining us. Do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, yeah. Hi, Max. Uh, I'm Malcolm Gaskill. I'm a historian of uh, witchcraft and 17th century transatlantic culture uh, and a emeritus professor of early modern history at the University of East Anglia in the UK. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. So you're the author of The Ruin of All Witches, Life mm. and Death in the New World. What is this book and what's it about? So this is a, uh, a micro history, a little case study of a small Massachusetts community right out on the Western frontier in the middle of the 17th century. So this is like 50 years before Salem. And uh, what happens there at this moment is that they have a little witch hunt. Now, what happens in this, this town, Springfield, really focuses on a married couple, Q and Mary Parsons. And they are kind of misfits, but they also become objects for projection of conflicted emotions among their neighbours. It's also a kind of folktale, a kind of real life uh, folktale, even a fairy tale, I think, because it's got all those kind of elements of the fairy tale, including, um, you know, not just a sort of remote community with all people living cheek by jowl with all sorts of dangers and tensions. But this is also a world of enchantment. Of, um, of sort of mini miracles and disasters and demons and devils. So it really does kind of operate, I think, uh, rather like a traditional fairy tale, except for the fact that it happens to be true. And what inspired you to write this book? So I've got a background in the social and cultural history uh, of the 17th century. And I've written a book about uh, England's worst witch hunt, which takes place between 1645 and 1647, um, called Witch Finders. This is during the period of the English Civil War when the world's turned upside down. And then I also wrote a book about uh, 17th century migrations from England to America. So that was a kind of a big overview. So in some ways, The Ruin of All Witches is a kind of bridge between the two books, following on the story of the East Anglian witch hunt in England, right into the way that these uh, ideas are, are, are transplanted to America. So this is a story that even delves into people's emotions and their dreams, right down to those kind of secret areas of existence that are familiar to us all, but are sometimes quite difficult to capture uh, in history. But there are very good sources for this. And actually, we're fortunate that when people do make witchcraft accusations, they do tell us how they felt. So, you know, I'm, I, I hope that some people will find that this reads a bit like a novel, but uh, I'm not making anything up. I'm kind of really um, relying on the way that people at the time said how they felt and the way that they felt was often very afraid, uh, even terrified, uh, and also very angry as well. When we think of witchcraft here in the U.S., especially in the context of American history, we think of the Salem witch trials. What makes the historical episode chronicled in The Ruin of All Witches different from Salem and important in its own right? Well, there's something about Salem, which is it kind of, you know, it stands in for all witch hunting, not just in America, but actually global witch hunting. It's such a famous episode, particularly because of Arthur Miller's play The Crucible where the, the Salem witch trials become a, uh, a political allegory, a parable of persecution and paranoia. So it's extremely well-known, iconic, in fact. But this is not just the high watermark of witch hunting. This is kind of the end, because after Salem, really, the whole idea of actually hunting witches, not so much just belief in witches, but actually witch hunting, pretty much implodes. But the story of Springfield does have many similarities to it, but it's really much earlier on. It's really at the start of the period when witchcraft accusations are starting to take hold um, in, in colonial America. 
So the, some of the similarities are tensions between neighbours, the uh, competition over resources and of land, the uh, tensions over political authority, uh, some uncertainty about uh, legal authority in the town, um, and also the, the evidence of children, the evidence of dreams, and famously from Salem, spectral evidence, the idea that the witches um, can somehow uh, manifest themselves in a spectral form and terrify uh, their victims in that way. So you get all those elements together. It's, of course, also a very uh, intensely introspectively religious society, too, where people are constantly experiencing religion uh, very, very internally, as if that battle between God and the devil, between right and wrong and good and evil is going on in their hearts, not just something that's going on outside in the community. There's something about if you look at any witchcraft story, there are always common denominators that are similar, but there's a very tight focus in Springfield, much more so than in Salem, I think, between these key characters of William Pynchon, who is the, uh, the, the town landlord and magistrate, does from everything really, and the minister George Moxon and this couple, Hugh and Mary Parsons. And the story really takes place in a triangle between those three characters, whereas at Salem, it's, it's actually a much more dispersed story, although you do get tensions between factions in the community and the minister and the magistrates and so on as well. So I have this notion in my head of Puritan New England as essentially a theocracy, a place where religion and government are infused. Um, is that true? How did the Puritans view the government's relationship with religion? Well, I think that they um, th these Puritans wouldn't necessarily have recognized the term theocracy because for them, that wasn't really a choice. I think that they took it for granted that that God was acting through them or rather that they would try to live up to what they thought was God's that was the mission that God had set for them um in new england so that they they felt very strongly that uh, god had brought them within a covenant and that they had to live up to this but of course this actually meant that they really fell short of this a lot of the time and this caused all sorts of other troubled emotions like um a, a sense of guilt really i suppose and shame um and that i think in the end that's something which they, they can't shake off and that's really that image of that stern, intolerant, inflexible Puritan that has come down to us through the Crucible and Nathaniel Hawthorne and, and the Scarlet Letter and, and that particular kind of um, 19th century American literature. So did these witch trials and other witchy sort of episodes like it in New England's early history impact the thinking of the founding fathers or other enlightenment thinkers from around the world did it impact their view of the separation of church and state religious freedom etc if at all um i don't think that it did directly but on both sides of the atlantic the the era of the witch hunt the history of the witch hunts which starts pretty much even before the witch hunts end that that history of the witch hunt uh does contribute to a sense that there should be reason and rationality in religion as well as in society more generally. And so I think that the memory of the witch trials is very useful in the modern age into the 18th and the 19th, even in the 20th centuries, because I think that it, it's a shortcut to teaching them about, well, inhumanity, um, the lack of charity between neighbours, and I think that the witch trials also um, work to illustrate the need to have rigorous proofs at law, to have a, what we would today call a law of evidence, and not to admit hearsay. And I think also witch hunting becomes just that, that sort of flip side of the ideal of, of enlightenment and reason and civility, which 18th and 19th century states and societies um, like to pride themselves on. Uh, do you have any final thoughts, uh, ways people can get in touch, order your book, learn more, get in contact, anything you want to share? This is sort of your open mic moment. 
Okay. Well, um, thanks. Well, I think that one of the things I would just say about this, about my book, The Ruin of All Witches, uh, which is out in the UK um, at the moment, it comes out in the States uh, with Knopf on the, the 1st of November. So, um, yeah, so obviously, um, please buy the book. Uh, and if anybody wants to follow me on Twitter, I'm at Malcolm Gaskell. Um, and I'm always putting little bits and pieces there about witchcraft and other things on there too. So it'd be great if I had some more followers. Excellent. Thank you so much, Malcolm. Well, it's an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting yeah. me on. Mm -hmm.